Humanity has suffered pandemics of various sizes and degrees of severity throughout history. They were recounted in the Bible, occurred during the reigns of Roman emperors like Justinian, and even followed the First World War. But the time of the Black Death was something else entirely. The story of the Black Death is the story of a perfect storm. It was the focal point where the conditions of cities, expansion of the human population, the explosion of trade, and just the right political situations met. A powerfully lethal bacterium with an equally powerful vector of transmission. It went by many names, the Black Death, the Plague, the Great Mortality, and many others. But we know it so well because of its infamy. It was, after all, estimated that 30 to 40 percent of Europe died. But Europe was not alone. Africa, the Middle East, India, and East Asia were all in its path of destruction. In the end, it was suspected that worldwide, 200 million people died. A number so high that every outbreak before or since has not even come close. And this is especially impressive when you figure in that the world population at the time was approximately 500 million. Our story begins not in Europe, but far to the east. No one is exactly certain where the plague hides its lair, but many agree it lies somewhere where the Great Eurasian Steppe meets the Gobi Desert. Some claim it came from the Mongolian Plateau, from a region of the Great Desert itself, a place that Marco Polo on his journey would say that when a traveler became isolated, he would hear the voices of devils leading him astray, and the arid wind could make a thousand fantasies throng to the mind. Whereas others felt it was on the banks of Lake Issyk-Kul, one of the deepest lakes in the world where the contagion lay in wait. Now left to its own devices, the plague would infect small rodents and animals, and due to its lethal nature, it would not have easily been able to escape its isolated domain. But by the mid-14th century, the steppe was unified by the Pax Mongolica, and trade had rebounded on a massive scale. What was once a desolate and isolated land was now crisscrossed by the Silk Roads. It was traversed by throngs of merchants hoping to make their fortune. A multitude of trade stations and oasis stopping points were also established. What's more, to expedite messages that kept the bureaucracy of the Great Mongol Empire and its later fractured states working, the riders of the Yam, essentially a Mongolian Pony Express, were created. Suddenly, the plague had a mechanism to expand its domain, and it eagerly awaited its chance to do so. In the Crimean Peninsula, quite a distance to the west, was the city of Kaffa. In the mid-13th century, she was a backwater, rural, rustic, some would say primitive fishing village. But the world was changing, and trade, which had languished since the fall of the Roman Empire, had emerged as a powerful force. And a really good example were the Italian city-states, which vied fiercely with one another for monetary hegemony. Nothing would stop them from expanding their bottom line. The quote-unquote crusaders of the Fourth Crusade, jumping over the walls of Constantinople in 1204, gave testament to that. Now to quote a Ferengi rule of acquisition, number 95 in case anybody's interested, expand or die. Thus, in 1266, the Genoese arrived at Kaffa and set to work making it a city to be reckoned with. By 1340, she boosted a population of 80,000 people, buildings dotted the horizon, her market was a flurry of activity, and the docks of Kaffa were renowned to house over 200 ships. The location was perfect for the business savvy. The Silk Roads ran just to the north and divided into several paths before going into Europe. The Volga and the Don Rivers were relatively nearby, adding to her commercial sphere of influence. And from her warm water port, ships would come and go from Constantinople, the Levant, Italy, and as far away as Iberia. In a short period of time, Kaffa had blossomed into a major focal point for bringing in luxury goods from both East and West. But, as is the case so many times in history, one civilization's success usually comes at the expense of her neighbors. 
the Mongol Empire was one of the largest land empires in history. By the time of Kublai Khan's death in 1294, it had fractured into four separate khanates. Each had their own agenda and modus operandi, but don't let the division fool you, each khanate was still very powerful, of which the Golden Horde exercised authority over the Crimea. To them, it was a small portion of their vast realm. Now, the armies of the Golden Horde were comprised to a certain extent with the Tartars. This was a nomadic tribe from eastern Mongolia that were conquered in the days of Genghis Khan. They had been integrated into the Mongolian armies and helped with the western expansion of the empire. By the mid-14th century, the Golden Horde relied on the Tartars to help govern their land. Now to put this all into context, Kaffa, and for that matter the Genoese presence, existed only because the Golden Horde allowed it. The land on which the trading city flourished was essentially a grant for the purposes of enriching the Khanate's bank account. But for the two decades leading up to the early 1340s, political, economic, and religious friction between the Mongols and the Genoese were mounting. Thus, by the year 1343, very little was needed to ignite a precarious situation into open hostility. Not too far from Kaffa was the trading city of Tana. It was nestled at the mouth of the Don River and renowned as being the jump point one takes to get to China. It was in this city that a small angry exchange on a market street blossomed into a full-blown riot, resulting in spilled blood. And to be specific, a Muslim died at the hands of an Italian, or at least as the tale goes. Well, either way, the story got out, and the local Mongol Khan, a man by the name of Yanni Beg, decided to arrive at the city gates and brought with him an impressive Tartar army. Under the auspices of being a defender of Islam, he demanded that the city capitulate. Now, in standard Mongol fashion, a besieged city had the option of either adhering to the terms of surrender completely, or taking their chances with fighting back, which usually resulted in the city and its people being wiped from the surface of the earth. The Genoese opted for the latter option and responded to Yanni Beg's terms with a particularly insolent response. In retrospect, perhaps this wasn't the best idea. The attackers, not expecting this kind of response, laid into Tana with a vengeance, and the city was quickly overrun. However, some of the defenders managed to escape and then ran for their lives back to Kaffa. The Tartar army pursued very closely. They were fully engaged to punish the Italians for their insult of resistance. To them and their Mongol Khan, these arrogant, decadent Genoese no longer had a right to exist in the Khanate any longer. But as I've mentioned before, Kaffa was an impressive city and her city walls were equally impressive, and thus the Tartar army and her Khan had to settle in for a siege. This was going to be a really long siege, and as it dragged out, something else was coming in on the heels of the Tartar horsemen. By 1346, tales of a strange disease had begun to filter their way west. Most of the stories were ignored, but they told of entire areas being destroyed and population centers being wiped out. Vast tracts of China and India lay dying of a mysterious pestilence, and the disease, like the stories about it, were making their way west. By early 1346, Russian chroniclers had recounted that the shores of the Caspian Sea were affected. In less than a year, it had spread across the Don and the Volga rivers, descended into the Crimean Peninsula, and onto an unsuspecting Tartar army. It didn't take long before the encampment was infected, and even less time before the besiegers began to die en masse. For the Genoese, protected by their city walls, this affliction was heaven sent. To them, it was nothing less than their god's retribution against the heathen race. And if they had any faith in this belief, they were soon to find out just how wrong they were. The situation in the Tartar camp was degrading by the day, to the point where more people were dying than could be easily attended to. The scene, if one could imagine, was that of putrid, swollen corpses stacked like cordwood as far as the eye could see. But perhaps what motivated the survivors to action was not so much the sight, but rather the disgusting, gut-wrenching stench. 
The Khan at this point, disgusted and revolted by the smell, gave the command to load the corpses onto catapults and then had them launched into the city. His hope was that the smell would accomplish what his army couldn't, that is to drive the inhabitants to surrender. Now keep in mind that the bodies were well into the faces of decomposition by the time they were weaponized. What's more, as the body rots, gases form within the various layers, fascia, and internal organs. It essentially putrefies. Thus, when it's launched with sufficient velocity and upon hitting a stone structure at the end of their trajectory, they wouldn't just impact and fall down. Rather, some would explode into chunks and aerosolized fragments, spraying an entire area and showering those unfortunate enough to be below. This went on for weeks. The city was essentially inundated with remains. The rats that were infesting the camp would follow the scent in short order, and with them, the plague entered the city. The Genoese, who were once confident behind their defenses and were scoffing at the enemy, now saw the dying commence once again. But this time, it was in their own streets, their own buildings, and in their own homes. What made the plague especially lethal was that it had an almost perfect vector for transmission. That is, the rats and fleas that carried it were well suited to allow it to spread. The black rat, or ratus ratus, thought to be one of the major species involved in transmission, evolved in Asia approximately 10 to 15,000 years ago. Now while it's half the size of its cousin, the brown rat, it compensates with its ability to reproduce. And what do I mean by this? Two rats mating continuously for three years can lead to a population of over three million. It is also an extremely resilient creature. It can climb nearly vertical surfaces, enter through openings a quarter inch thick, and survive a fall of five stories. And by the way, rodent comes from the Latin rodere, meaning to gnaw. And as such, its powerful jaw can cut its way through lead, adobe, and unhardened concrete. Medieval city walls simply didn't stand a chance. Now once inside a city or on board a ship, it can exhibit problem-solving intelligence. After establishing a nest or a den, it purposely creates an escape route before cautiously forging for food. Indeed, it essentially conducts reconnaissance, changing the areas that it explores and adapting quickly to any change in its environment. But perhaps its most unsettling aspect is that it serves as an almost perfect reservoir for fleas. The oriental flea, known as Xenopsilla chiopsis, is also called, for obvious reasons, the rat flea. It has a preference to get its blood meal from a rat or other rodent, but if that source is limited or exterminated, it's happy to try something else. And while it's waiting for something else to come on the menu, it has a certain degree of patience. This flea can endure for more than a month without a host. And during this time, it can live on clothing, baggage, fur, hair, or for that matter, corpses that are catapulted through the air. Once a target is sensed, its powerful hind legs allow it to jump over half a meter. And once it lands, its exceptional bite can penetrate directly into the bloodstream of its host, where it can suck up a meal. Now in a normal flea, this blood would flow without interruption into the flea's stomach. Plague-infested fleas, on the other hand, were a completely different story. Once infected, the plague bacterium would multiply within the flea itself, blocking its foregut, and more importantly, its ability to ingest a meal. This would make the flea even more voracious, resulting in multiple bites. And with each bite, the plague bacteria would be regurgitated into the host. Now this brings us to our main culprit, the bubonic plague is caused by the bacterium Yasernia pestis, and to emphasize, this is not a virus. Viruses are smaller, work on a different mechanism, and their infectivity is distinctive. Once Yasernia pestis is inside the human host, it reproduces aggressively. Using its own unique enzymes, it can invade organs and a lymphatic system. This system, by the way, is crucial to the body. It is one of the key members of our immune defense and is responsible for eliminating foreign contagion. But for the purposes of the plague, it becomes its new home, which can seem a little counterintuitive. 
The reason for this is that the plague is extremely adaptive, which allows it to evade the otherwise very competent human immune system. And while the immune system is busy chasing its own tail, Yasernia pestis spreads from lymph node to lymph node to lymph node and multiplies at a ferocious rate. But of course, for the defenders of Kaffa, with no knowledge of germ theory, epidemiology, and no insight on how this was spreading, not to mention that antibiotics would not come around for, oh, 600 years, this was nothing less than a glimpse into the apocalypse. By April of 1347, there was very little left of the Tartar army around Kaffa. By the time of the spring rains, the straggling survivors had retreated. Many who left were infected and took the plague with them to other destinations. However, by then the contagion had made its way well into the city, and there the scenario had become equally appalling. John Kelly, in his book, The Great Mortality, does a great job of describing what the situation in the city was like before the Tartars left. Quote, As the death toll mounted, the streets would have been filled with feral animals, feeding on human remains, drunken soldiers looting and raping, old women dragging corpses through rubble, and burning buildings spewing jets of flame and smoke into the Crimean sky. There would have been swarms of rodents and piles of bodies stacked like cordwood in every public square, and in every eye a look of wild panic or dull resignation. The scenes in the harbor, the only means of escape in besieged Kaffa, would have been equally horrific. Surging crowds and sword-wielding guards, children wailing for lost or dead parents, shouting and cursing, everybody pushing towards teeming ships. And beyond the melee on the departing galleys, prayerful passengers hugging one another under great white sheets of unfurling sail, ignorant that below deck in dark, sultry holds, hundreds, if not thousands, of plague-bearing rats were scratching themselves and sniffing at the cool sea air." End quote. As I've said before, Kaffa was an impressive city. Equally impressive was her port, which could shelter nearly 200 ships. At this point in history, panic had engulfed the populace, and getting out was the only thing the inhabitants could think of. Thus, it wasn't just one Genoese galley that managed to depart, but several. Their journey would take them south through the Black Sea, then through the narrow Bosphorus and the Sea of Marmara. Their destinations were the great ports of the entire Mediterranean world.